I'm going to be talking about item 128 from the classical civilization section of the museum. This is an enamel and silver bracelet made in Cairo, Egypt, that is thought to have been a souvenir from the 1920s. This places it as being made during an era of fascination with Egypt, largely due to the hype surrounding the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 by Harold Carter and his team. I'll talk more about this context later, but first I'll briefly outline why, out of all of the objects in the museum, I chose such a small and relatively recent object to research. I studied classics as part of my degree. The 15 panels that make up the bracelet link to my interest in ancient societies, depicting scenes that give an insight into ancient Egypt. This was a typical feature of jewellery at the time, with the Art Deco style that was emerging in the 1920s being heavily influenced by ancient Egyptian motifs. Several panels particularly stood out to me on the bracelet. For instance, the chariot rider under the huge bow is striking, as is the image of a royal servant offering food to a stately looking individual seated on a throne. Along with the other panels, including one depicting a body being prepared for the next life, these scenes depict multiple aspects of society, from warfare and fighting to contemporary social hierarchies, as well as ancient Egyptian beliefs surrounding death. This shows how the bracelet is an important expression of the obsession with all aspects of ancient Egypt in the 1920s. As previously mentioned, this can be credited to the unearthing of Tutankhamun's tomb on the 4th of November 1922. This was an incredibly important discovery as it dispelled thoughts that the Valley of the Kings was exhausted. The excitement surrounding the find was heightened by rumours of a curse. Incited by the rapid deaths of many team members involved in the dig, the curse myth was exacerbated by the death of the 5th Earl of Carnarvon, the financial backer of the venture. He died in strange circumstances shortly after attending the official opening of the tomb on the 5th of April, when a mosquito bite became infected, leading to a blood poisoning. This was made all the more odd by the fact the fatal bite which was on his cheek matched a wound that Tutankhamun was found to have. The media grabbed hold of this myth, and coupled with the exoticism surrounding the distant land, Egypt became a fashionable place to visit. Tourists had first started visiting Egypt in large numbers after Thomas Cook, founder of the travel company, had led an excursion there in 1869. As travel was beginning to become cheaper and more accessible, people began to flock to the country. However, the journey was still long and arduous. Travels would have to go from London to Paris by plane, and then the remainder of the journey would have to be done either across land or by sea, taking around two weeks. It is therefore unsurprising that visitors bought souvenirs, such as this bracelet, to remember their tr epic trip by. I like to think of a lady wearing the bracelet around her friends to show off how worldly she was and prompt questions about her travels to exotic Egypt. The bracelet also reveals some interesting collisions between modern day and ancient thought, particularly surrounding the value attributed to jewellery. It was common practice for ancient Egyptians to be buried with jewels. Indeed, Chef Mut, the mummy in the museum, was buried with many decorative ornaments. Similarly, one of the richest treasures in Tutankhamun's tomb was a decorated funeral mask, inset with precious stones such as lapis lazuli. This shows that adornment and jewellery were valued, linking to the bracelet's use as a souvenir that would have held value to the owner, a treasured reminder of an exciting trip. The colours of the bracelet throw out some interesting parallels with ancient thought. The blue across the top of each panel reminds me of Egyptian blue, used widely in ancient jewellery, such as the necklaces found in the cabinet opposite this bracelet. Egyptian blue was the first synthetic pigment used from the 3rd millennium BC. Known as artificial lapis lazuli, it was highly valued, being associated with the sky and water, symbolic of life and rebirth. Additionally, the gods' hair and faces were depicted as blue, and the colour was particularly connected with the god Amun, who came to be worshipped as the almighty creator. Blue was also linked to the pharaohs, showing associations with royalty which still stand. For instance, we have the colour royal blue. Therefore, the bracelet's colours represent how it harks back to a time different to its own, helping to preserve it. This can be seen to be what we're doing by putting the bracelet in a museum. You could question why an object that is so recent in the grand scheme of history has a place alongside more ancient pieces. This is similar to the Tapestry in the World Cultures Gallery, depicting life by the Nile, completed in 2009. 
Considering the ancient Egyptian period started seven to 8,000 years ago, it is questionable whether these are old enough to be considered museum pieces. Similarly, compared to the rich and gem inset jewellery the ancient Egyptians were buried with, this bracelet would have cost relatively little. It reminds me of bracelets that are widely available in modern day tourist places, such as saint bracelets in Italy, which are similarly made of small panels. However, by placing it in a museum, we give the bracelet high value, which I think is rightly deserved. Despite being one of the smallest objects in the museum, it helps preserve the past, giving a fascinating insight into two important eras, the 1920s and ancient Egypt, which it pays homage to.